Okay. So it's okay. Uh, so it's a great, uh, very great pleasure to introduce <clears throat> the first speaker uh, from uh, Waseda University. I'm not sure I pronounce it correctly. Waseda. 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 Yeah. Waseda, Waseda yeah. University. Uh, so uh, a bit more uh, to the east. <laughs> and um, that's uh, Hun Chung. Yeah. Uh, uh, whose work I got to know uh, via Olivier. Um, he has this uh, great paper in Erkenntnis about uh, John Rawls, but now uh, more recently he also published this paper with John Duggan in the American Political Science Review, uh, which is extremely uh, fitting for the present workshop. And so um, I'm very happy to, to have him here. Uh, so Hun Chung, uh, the floor is yours. All right, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction and inviting me to give a talk uh, and present my paper, the joint work uh, with John Duggan. And this is basically a paper um, that was published actually last year in uh, APSR in here. And I'm currently actually um, uh, writing a sequel uh, to this paper with a, another set of like co-authors and I was sort of like contemplating whether I should present that instead of this, but uh, the new paper that I'm currently writing is not um, exactly finished. So I simply decided to present this. So um, some of you might have already like uh, seen this paper and have like uh, heard me giving this talk uh, from different occasions, but I'll nonetheless start. All right. so. So first of all, like, um, here's the question, what is deliberative democracy? And basically deliberative democracy uh, is founded on the basic principle uh, that outcomes are democratically legitimate if and only if they could be the object of a free and reasoned agreement among equals. And this is how uh, Joshua Cohen in his like uh, seminal paper on deliberative democracy defined uh, deliberative democracy. And many people uh, think of deliberative democracy as a reaction or a response to the perceived failures of aggregated uh, democracy or the many impossibility results of a social choice theory. So in social choice theory, it has been shown by many, the so-called impossibility theorems, a lot of uh, negative results that pertain to aggregated forms of democracy, which shows that uh, voting outcomes tend to be uh, arbitrary, um, very unstable. They tend to produce like voting cycles and they're also uh, subject to strategic manipulation. So the basic thought is that uh, from this, many people have thought that the mere fact that a specific decision has been reached by the result of a particular voting procedure uh, gives us very little reason to think that such decision is truly democratically justified and legitimate. So as an alternative, uh, people, people have started to propose that we should um, include and incorporate a process of democratic deliberation uh, into our democratic process and regard only those outcomes that survive and sustain through the process of reasoned uh, deliberation, democratic deliberation as being legitimate and fully just. So we can see here that at the heart of this whole uh, research program of deliberative democracy is democratic deliberation. And our basic uh, aim of this paper is to present a formal theory. It's not the formal theory, it's just um, a formal theory of democratic deliberation. So one form of democratic deliberation that could be possible, all right? So here is basically uh, the overview of the, the formal theory that we present in this paper. So at first, we uh, first present a formal model of arguments that is going to form the basis of our formal model of deliberation. And our formal model of arguments uh, consists of first, a set of positions, and second, a set of reasons or arguments that can be used to support various positions. And third, an assessment of the effectiveness of these arguments, all right? So based on our formal model of arguments, we then uh, present uh, three models 
of democratic deliberation and basically analyze uh, their uh, properties and so forth, right? So the first mode of democratic deliberation that we present is called what we call a myopic discussion. And this is a form of uh, deliberation that has minimal structure that builds upon our formal model of arguments and which allows discussion to kind of like flow in a very free flowing manner without uh, constraints, with, without any uh, minimal amount of constraints and restrictions. And it turns out that um, as a form of democratic deliberation, myopic discussion tends to be inconclusive. That is, it never concludes. It is also subject to cycling. And furthermore, it can always reach inferior positions, right? And so forth. And we can see that as a form of democratic deliberation, myopic discussion is subject to exactly the same problems and the negative um, results, negative um, uh, results that aggregated forms of uh, democracy generally have, right? So it, uh, as a form of democratic deliberation, it is not that good. And what we can further see here is that the mere fact that uh, adding a separate process of democratic deliberation might not get us too far. Uh, what is important is not simply the addition of democratic deliberation, but uh, a particular form of democratic deliberation that has some structure that will be able to produce uh, the ideals of deliberative democracy, as well as uh, the many desirable normative properties that uh, uh, advocates of deliberative democracy uh, claim, right? So uh, we then add more structure to the basic model of uh, myopic discussion, and we present what's then called a constructive discussion. And in a constructive discussion, it turns out that it performs better than myopic discussion in the sense that a, construction, a constructive discussion will always conclude uh, so it will never, uh, it, it will be conclusive. But the, the problem of constructive discussion is that the specific conclusion that has been reached by the constructive discussion is going to be path dependent. Meaning that depending on how we have performed our prior uh, stages of deliberation, uh, our, our discussion or deliberation might lead us to reach completely different outcomes and so forth. And that is in the sense, constructive discussion is still doesn't perform um, uh, as well as we want democratic liberation to perform um, because the outcomes that it is finally reached is uh, arbitrary. Right? So we then add uh, um, disagreements and opposing interests, as well as uh, we allow the participants to endogenously uh, determine and uh, lead the discussion. And we then present a model of what we call a strategic debate. And it turns out that uh, a strategic debate is not only conclusive, but it is also path dependent, independent, in the sense that it will always reach a unique outcome. And it will also turn out that the unique outcome that uh, the debate reaches will also tend to be fair, uh, representing a fair compromise of the um, participants. All right. So that's our basic overview. And let us first now uh, then continue and kind of like um, go through our basic model of arguments. All right. So, a formal model of arguments. So, one important premise of uh, deliberative democracy is that it is solely the force of better reasons and better arguments and not, for example, one's uh, political power, uh, political or economic power that determines the legitimacy uh, of political outcomes. And here in this section, we will uh, provide a formal model of this most basic requirement of deliberative democracy. That is a formal model of arguments or reasons. So here, let X be a non-empty set of positions and let A be any non-empty uh, finite set of arguments or reasons. And the basic thought is that uh, people can use the arguments or reasons in set A to support various positions in set X, okay? And now uh, we're trying going to sort of represent the effectiveness 
how persuasive these arguments or reasons are in supporting Borea's position by a set value relation on X, uh, by a uh, mapping P that takes any ordered pair of positions, X and Y, and then it maps it uh, into a subset of arguments or reasons, all right? So P, X, Y is going to be a subset of A, and A, again, is a finite set of arguments or reasons, and so forth. And the basic interpretation is going to be that P, X, Y is going to denote the set of reasons or arguments that, that are effective to support position X over position Y, right? So it's a set of reasons or arguments that you can use to support X, uh, X against Y, right? So here is a very simple uh, example. Suppose that uh, we're considering two policy uh, options. We can either increase taxes or decrease taxes. And suppose that the basic reasons or arguments uh, that we think are relevant, the shared set of reasons or arguments is uh, people care, we all care about economic efficiency, and we also care of, about distributive fairness, right? So here, P, uh, tax arrow, up, up arrow, tax down arrow equals like the set F will basically mean that uh, distributive fairness is going to be a reason that uh, somebody can use to support the policy of increasing taxes uh, as opposed to decreasing taxes. And this is going to basically mean that economic efficiency is going to be a reason that somebody can use to support the policy of decreasing taxes as opposed to increasing taxes, okay? All right, so, all right. Uh, so for each argument in A or each argument or uh, reason in A, there's some time lag uh, in this art. So we're going to define a binary relation, PA, okay, on the set of positions, right? And such that we're going to say that a certain position X is superior to another position Y with respect to the argument A, right? The specific reason or argument A, if and only if uh, we, we, we can use A as a reason to support X against Y, okay? That's how we define the binary relation. And now we're going to uh, define three properties of P of our, um, of our set value relation. And the three properties, so we're not going to assume that P is going to have all these properties in uh, all situations, but uh, we are first going to um, assume this. So property, the first property says that for all positions X and Y, right, the intersection between PXY and PYX is the empty set. What that basically means is that uh, no argument, so it based, the property one basically means that no argument that is effective for X against Y is effective for Y against X, right? So any argument that you use to support X against Y cannot be used to be, uh, support y over x, right? And that seems pretty uh, plausible. So we're going to basically assume this property of uh, p. The second property is as follows. The second property says that for all positions x and y, right, that are different for any distinct position x and y, pxy, the union of pxy and pyx is the entire set of reasons or arguments, right? And intuitively, what this basically means is that we don't have any superfluous or redundant arguments or reasons in the set of shared reasons or arguments uh, that the participants have, right? So you have, you pick any two positions that are distinct and you pick any reason or argument from set A, then either uh, that reason or argument is a argument that can be used to support X against Y, or it can be an argument or a reason that can be used to support Y against X, right? but from this, not both, right? So at least every reason is an argument or is a relevant reason or argument, right? So here. So the third uh, property basically says that for uh, any three positions, X and Y and Z, uh, PX, the intersection of PXY and PYZ is the subset of PXZ, okay? 
So what this basically means is that whenever some reason A is an effective argument against X against Y, that is, it is a reason in, included in PXY, and it is also a reason that is included in PYX, that is, it's also an effective argument against Y against Z, then the same reason also has to be an effective argument against X against Z as well, right? So these are the three properties uh, that we define for uh, the set value relation P. And it turns out that given property A, so we when P meets property one, uh, PA, the binary relation that we have uh, defined above, turns out to be asymmetric, right? Uh, that is for all X and Y, uh, the fact that X is superior to Y with respect to uh, uh, reason A implies that Y is not right uh, superior to X with respect to reason A. And if P meets property two, it turns that the binary relation PA is going to be total, right? So, right. And when the uh, P meets property three, it will turn out that the binary relation uh, defined above is going to be transitive, right? Therefore, the upshot is that if our set value relation, which is supposed to represent the effectiveness of various reasons or arguments against any pair of positions, satisfy the three properties of one, two, and three, then we can basically view PA as linear orders that are defined in X that can rank uh, all the positions in X into a single line. So for each argument A, we can, uh, each argument or reason, we are able to uh, rank all the positions in X from best to worst with respect to that reason or argument, right? Because asymmetry, totality, and transitivity are defining uh, properties of a linear order, right? So here, uh, for each argument or reason A, let X A denote the top ranked position of the binary relation PA, right? So basically XA is going to denote the best alternative uh, in terms of the specific reason or criteria A. So here is an example of uh, which car should we buy, which is going to uh, come up again and again. So suppose that there are three um, alternatives, a luxury sedan, a minivan, and a sports car. And suppose that there are like three criteria that we consider relevant. We uh, think fuel economy is important, uh, the overall cost is important, and performance is important. So X consists of L, V, S, and the set of reasons or argument consists of F, C, and P. So suppose that P satisfies all the three properties, right? Properties one, two, three, then we can have, uh, there exist linear orders, three linear orders, each corresponding to the reasons or arguments in set A. We have PF, a linear order PF, PC, and PP. And for instance, um, instance, we can have something like this. So in terms of fuel economy, the luxury saturn is best, uh, the minivan is second, sports car is worst. In terms of like overall cost, the minivan is best, sports car is second, and the luxury sedan is worst. In terms of like overall performance, the sports car is best, the luxury sedan, and so forth, right? So we have these like three linear orders, each corresponding to each consideration or reason. And from this, we can see that the top ranking alternative with respect to fuel economy is the luxury sedan. Uh, the top ranking alternative with respect to cost is the minivan. And the top ranking alternative with respect to performance is the sports car, right? So you can kind of look at that. So we're going to say that a position X is unassailable, right? If for all, position Y, PYX is empty, right? In other words, a position X is unassailable if there exists no position that is superior to it on any argument, right? So uh, you pick any argument, uh, any position Y, and there exists no argument uh, that you can use to support the superiority of Y over X, right? So X is unassailable, right? Um, there exists no other position that is better than it in, in any consideration, right? So let UA denote the set of unassailable positions. And 
we can see that an unassailable position, if there exists one, would be a very strong candidate uh, for a collective agreement, right? Uh, because it cannot be, uh, there exists no consideration with which some other position is superior to it. But uh, it turns out in very many cases, the set of unassailable position can very well be empty, right? So it turns uh, UA can very well be uh, zero and we can check uh, due to kind of like the lack of time, I'll not go through it in detail, but in the previous car example, it, the, it sort of like mimics the previous car example has the preference ordering of the Condorcet's paradox, right? And so forth. Um, but in that example, it turns out that uh, there exists no unassailable positions, right? So given uh, two positions, X and Y, we say that X dominates Y, and we're going to write X P bar Y, if there exists some reason or argument for which X is better than Y, and there exists no argument or reason or argument for which Y is better than X, okay? And we can formally define uh, domination uh, like this. And it is clear that a dominated position would not be a plausible choice in our setup, okay? So we say that a position is undominated if there exists no position Y that dominates it. And we let UD, basically denote the set of undominated positions, right? That is, it uh, consists of the set of alternatives such that there exists no other alternative Y that dominates it, okay? So note that if a position is unassailable, then it is undominated. So uh, UA is a subset of UD, okay? So uh, that concludes our basic setup of our model of arguments uh, and so forth. And from this, we will now uh, define um, what we call a open discussion. So according to uh, Gottman and Thompson, uh, one of the major characteristics of deliberative democracy is that its process is dynamic, right? And that is, although a decision, uh, that's what they say, quote, uh, although a decision must stand for some period of time, it is provisional, right? In the sense that it must be open to challenge at some point in the future. So we, in modeling our uh, model of open discussion, we're going to try to incorporate this dynamic feature of deliberative democracy and model, uh, present a model of discussion as follows. So we imagine a discussion proceeding sequentially over an unbounded number of rounds. So in each round M, there's going to be a current status quo position ZM and the current status quo position ZM is going to be challenged by a challenger position XM with an argument AM in round M, right? So formally a sequence uh, D, right? D is going to be a discussion, discussion, uh, a sequence of a challenger position, an argument, as well as a status quo position is going to be a discussion. If for all natural numbers M, we're going to have that the status quo in the next round in round M plus one is either the current status quo position or the challenger. So either the status quo kind of like um, retained is retained or it is uh, uh, replaced by the challenger position. And whenever the next period, M plus one period status quo, if whenever the challenger that is different from the status quo replaces the status quo and become the next period uh, status quo, then that will imply that the argument that was used in that round N is an argument that can be used to support the challenger position against the status quo position, right? So if uh, the challenger is becomes the next uh, round status quo position, we're going to say that the challenger position is dis justified by the argument or reason AM that was used in that round and whenever the challenger that uh, replaces the status quo position is different from the current status quo uh, position, we're going to say that the challenger position XM is going to be inserted by argument AM, right? right. So we're going to now call a sequence of position and argument pairs, right? Introduced to challenge the status quo uh, position, a protocol. And that's going to be the protocol of the discussion. And we're going to say that the discussion is open 
if each potentially effective position or argument pair appears infinitely often uh, in the protocol. Uh, by potentially effective, meaning that it, ha it, has, it, uh, it is possible for the position to be inserted into the discussion and justified by the discussion uh, by the uh, argument or, or reason. So based on our um, uh, setup of an open discussion, we're going to uh, define uh, one particular form of an open discussion that we, which we call a myopic discussion. Okay. So here is a myopic discussion. So a myopic discussion is simply an open discussion, right? Such that for all uh, natural number M, right? For each round M, uh, the status cool uh, the, the next period status quo position zm plus one uh, is going to be this all right so the challenging position in that round m is going to be going to replace this status quo and become the next period status quo position if the argument that was used in that round is in p xm zm meaning that uh, the argument that was used in round m can be used to support the challenger, a challenging position against the status quo position. And if this is not the case, then the, uh, the current status quo position becomes the status quo in the next round as well. So in a myopic discussion, a position may replace the status quo uh, by any argument for which it is superior, regardless of the history of the discussion, right? So whenever a status quo position is uh, meets a challenging position and, uh, with a supporting argument for which the challenging position is superior, that challenging position is going to replace the status quo position in a myopic discussion without considering like uh, the history of how the discussion has uh, played so far. So then the question is, so we have now uh, def defined um, one form, one simple form of uh, democratic deliberation. Then the question then is, how well does myopic discussion meet the ideals of deliberative democracy, right? And many deliberative de democrats have argued that deliberation should at least ideally aim for unanimous agreement, right? So the question is, would democratic deliberation uh, through myopic discussion eventually lead to unanimous agreement? So a problem with myopic discussion is that it may generate cycles uh, representing perpetual disagreement. And here is an example of cycling that uh, happens in myopic discussions. So suppose that the initial status quo in our previous like car example is the sports car and consider the following myopic discussion here, right? So uh, here actually, so, okay. so. Um, all right, so uh, let so it starts with the sports car, and you might uh, not remember this here. So I kind of like prepared this in a separate slide. Can can everybody see this? So this all right, all right. So all right, so we can we have the. Um, Three car models, and they're 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 uh, and how how well, how each car is ordered uh, by each consideration here, and the discussion is here. So if we first start with the sports car S, and this sports car in the first round is challenged by the minivan with respect to fuel economy, and we can see that in terms of fuel economy, the minivan is superior to the sports car. So by the rules of myopic discussion. The minivan is going to replace the sports car and it then becomes the next period status quo, right? So in period two, we start with a status quo with a minivan, but in period uh, two, uh, this minivan is going to be challenged by the luxury sedan with respect to fuel economy, right? And we can see that the luxury sedan is also superior to the minivan with respect to fuel economy. So therefore the luxury sedan is going to replace the minivan and become the period two status quo position, right? And then this moves on to period three and period three, we can see that this time the sports car challenges the luxury sedan and challenges it in terms of cost. And we can see that 
in terms of cost, sports car is better than the luxury sedan. So it will replace and become the new status quo position. So we started with S and this, uh, the sports car. And then in the next round, we, uh, the, the status quo became the minivan. And then the next round, it became the luxury sedan. But we returned to S. And the cycle of SV, uh, we repeat the cycle of SVL, 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 and so forth. Right? So this basic example uh, illustrates that a myopic discussion can cycle and never reach unanimous agreement. So here, I'll just like skip. There is a very like cute, um, interesting clip in The Simpsons that sort of like has a myopic, uh, that illustrates myopic discussion. But uh, since I'm kind of like, sort of like short of time, I'll skip this one. So the fact that it is possible for myopic discussions to cycle is worrisome, but it may not be too bad if this happens seldomly, right? Then how likely would myopic discussion lead to unanimous agreement? So we're going to say that a discussion is conclusive, right? If there is some round after which the status quo is never revised, right? That is, if there exists some round M such that for any round after uh, M, the status quo does not change, right? In which case, we're going to say that the discussion concludes with the position of the status quo position in round M, and therefore. So when a discussion is conclusive, we can say that it meets at least one desideratum of deliberative democracy. That is the ideal of unanimous agreement. And a corollary of our theorem four basically says that, um, assume that we have a finite set of position, a myopic discussion is conclusive. If it is conclusive, then uh, this implies that there exists an unassailable position X and a natural number M such that for Every round greater or equal to M, the status quo position is the unassailable position, right? In other words, what this basically means is that in order for a myopic discussion to be conclusive, whenever it's conclusive, there must be an unassailable position, right? So the un only condition under which that a myopic discussion will conclude is for there to be some position that is unassailable. And as we have seen from our car example, the set of unassailable position is very likely to be empty. Right? So uh, we cannot generally expect that an unassailable position, which is a position that cannot be beaten by any uh, position by any argument exists. Right? So this means that a myopic discussion will in many cases never conclude. So what's worse is that a myopic discussion may visit uh, dominated positions infinitely often. And here is an example that shows that. So suppose that we have like four different positions, A, B, C, D, and we have like two reasons or arguments under consideration, shared reasons are uh, A and A prime. And suppose that we have something like this, okay? So, right? And suppose we can see here that position D dominates, right? It's better than position A and B in both arguments, right? So D dominates A and B. And we can see that also A dominates B because A is better than B in terms of like both arguments, okay? So um, A and B are both dominated positions. And if we have the following uh, myopic discussion, which starts with position A and have the following protocol. So A is first challenged by D with respect to A. So we can see we start with A uh, is challenged by D with respect to A. So it, it changes to D, right? And the next round, D is then challenged by C with respect to A. So it changes to C, right? And in the third round, C is then challenged by position B with respect to A prime. And we can see that B is superior to C here. So it then replaces C. So we then return to B and then uh, afterwards, B is challenged by A with respect to um, a, a, a and so forth. So we can see that here it starts with A. The biopic discussion starts with A, it changes to D and C, and, and then it goes to A back again and it um, visits the two dominated positions, A and B, infinitely often. Right? So, so forth, right? Uh, yeah. 
So here are the limits of, of uh, my peak discussions. We have just seen that my peak discussion as a mode of open democratic deliberation fails to meet many ideals of deliberative democracy. Um, unless there is an unassailable position, my peak discussion is inconclusive and may cycle endlessly uh, failing to produce unanimous agreement. And furthermore, the limit set of a myopic discussion may contain dominated positions, right? And the lesson basically is that simply adding some process of deliberation does not in itself, right, solve the problem of democratic justification introduced by the many impossibility theorems of social choice theory. So if we wish democratic deliberation to serve as a medium for uh, democratic justification and legitimacy, we need to impose further uh, structure and further structure on dem uh, democratic deliberation itself. So we do add some further structure and define what we now call a constructive discussion. So here is how a constructive discussion is defined. So a constructive discussion, just like a myopic discussion is an open discussion, right? But it gives additional restrictions on how a challenging position can replace a status quo position, right? So here in a constructive discussion, if some position X has been justified by some argument A, then in order to insert a new position Y with the same argument, the new position Y has to be strictly better than Y, uh, X in terms of that argument, right? So in other words, in, in a constructive discussion, in a myopic discussion, whenever the challenger position was superior to the status quo position with respect to that argument, it can replace it right away. But in a constructive discussion, it doesn't happen right away. In order for it to be insert and replace the status quo position, it has to be superior not only to the status quo position, but it has to also be superior to all the previous positions that has been inserted into the discussion by the same argument, right? So formally, uh, we can define it as follows, right? So it, starting in round M, the new status quo for round M plus one, so the challenger can become the new status quo position by replacing uh, the current round status quo. If first, it has to be superior to this status quo with respect to the argument that is being used in that round, but that's not it. It also has to be superior to all other previously uh, inserted position that was inserted by the same argument. So if there were any positions that was inserted into the discussion by using the same argument, then the current challenger has to be superior uh, to any of the previous position with respect to the argument or, or uh, reason that has been used in that round, All right? So a constructive discussion differs from a myopic discussion in that it is history dependent, right? It is also con context dependent in the sense that in order to insert a position as status quo by a particular argument, the position must fare better with respect to that argument than than any previous status quo, quo that was itself justified by, by that argument, right? So it, um, so whether or not a challenger can replace the status quo position depends on the, the previous, how the history of the uh, discussion has taken place in the previous rounds. So here is our theorem six. So assume X is finite and suppose that P satisfies two properties, properties one and three, right? And <clears throat> So this is asymmetry and this was a uh, transitivity of the corresponding binary relation. Then it turns out that every constructive discussion is conclusive, uh, meaning that there is a position X and some round M such that uh, the status quo is going to stay there uh, for all rounds that are greater or equal to M. So it concludes, right, it concludes. Finally, if P not only satisfies its properties one and three, but it also satisfies property two, right? Which makes the binary relation PA uh, total. Then, uh, then the, the position, the conclusive position of the constructive discussion is going to be the top ranking alternative of some argument or reason, right? So, so here it says that, the first says that if we have properties one and three, the constructive discussion is going to, it's guaranteed to conclude. If we also have property two, it's going to conclude with a top ranking alternative uh, position with, ref, with, um, with respect to some argument or reason, right? So as a mode of democratic deliberation, 
constructive discussion possesses many desirable properties that myopic discussion lacked. So at first it concludes and reaches unanimous agreement for a given position. So it meets one ideal of deliberative democracy. Second, the final position to which a constructive discussion converges is maximally. So it does not conclude with any arbitrary like position. It always concludes with some position that is at the top of at least one consideration we think is relevant. So it is maximally justified and hence best in terms of at least one reason or argument. And a constructive discussion will also never conclude with dominated positions, right? As we saw, myopic discussion can visit uh, dominated positions infinitely often, but a constructive discussion will never conclude with a dominated position. So as a medium of democratic justification, we can see that a constructive discussion performs better than a uh, myopic discussion, but then the question is how good is, uh, is constructive discussion actually? So we wouldn't want to say that a, a that a conclusion of a constructive discussion is fully justified if we could have arrived at a completely different conclusion if we preceded our constructive discussion in a different manner. So let D be a constructive discussion and let uh, lambda D denote the concluding positions of D. And note that uh, since a constructive discussion is always guaranteed to conclude, lambda D is going to be non-empty. And let uh, this big lambda denote the set of all possible conclusions of a constructive dis uh, discussion D. And then we're going to say that a constructive discussion is path dependent if there can be uh, more than one. Uh, potential conclusions of a constructive discussion, okay? So it turns out that constructive discussion is path dependent. Uh, so suppose that P satisfies the three properties, then uh, suppose we have at least two considerations or reasons, right? Then the set of all concluding positions of a constructive discussion is going to be the set of all top ranking positions of each argument or uh, reason, right? So in other words, a constructive discussion is path dependent. It can, um, all right, so it's going to conclude with some top ranking alternative, but all the top ranking alternatives of every reason can be a potential conclusion of a constructive discussion, right? So that is any top ranking alternative of any reason can potentially be the conclusion of a constructive discussion. And in other words, any conclusion of a constructive uh, discussion is dependent on the particular discussion leading to it. And in this sense, it is arbitrary. So the main reason why uh, William Riker uh, infamously said that electoral outcomes are meaningless is due to its inherent arbitrariness of all electoral outcomes. And if it is this arbitrariness of voting outcomes that makes it hard for aggregated voting mechanisms to fully ground democratic justification, then our theorem seven shows that us uh, constructive discussions does not take us very far. So there's still a sense of arbitrariness here. So here is an example of uh, a path dependence of with our car purchase. And the only the point here is uh, that we have like three different constructive discussions and each concludes with a different car model, uh, which is a top position of each consideration. So there could be all three car models that we consider can be a potential conclusion of a constructive discussion. And in that case, uh, we wouldn't want that, right? So so thus, every car that is top ranked according to one of the criteria is a possible conclusion of a constructive discussion and so forth. So we've seen that constructive discussion performs better, but it is still not ideal. So we will now add more structure to our model and define what we call a, a strategic model of debate. All right, so, uh, all right, so in a debate, the way that a challenger position replaces a status quo position is the same as that of a constructive discussion. But unlike the protocol of a constructive discussion, which is given exogenously, the protocol of a debate is determined endogenously by the strategic moves played by the participants. So we assume that there are two debaters, one, players one and two, who alternately argue for different positions supplied with supporting arguments. So player one moves in all odd rounds and player two moves in all even rounds. And there exists an initial status quo position, Z1 is given. And in any round M, the active player can basically uh, propose a position and an argument, a supporting argument, and so forth, right? So basically, uh, let HM denote a history of 
length m that represents all the uh, status quo positions and all the arguments and um, positions that have been used throughout the discussion. So a pure strategy is going to be a mapping denoted by sigma i from every history at which the player is active into the set of possible actions. And the set of possible action is basically a pair, which consists of a set of position as well as a supporting argument, right? So given an initial status quo position, a pair of strategies, sigma one and sigma two, is going to then determine a path of play such that if M is odd, right, the strategy of player one, it, it's going to be uh, when M is odd, it's going to be player one's turn to argue for a position. And the strategy a sigma one is going to assign some position and an argument pair to uh, that player, okay? Uh, so let, so we are uh, let UI denote the payoff to participant I from the final positions. So what we're assuming here is that each participant cares about uh, the final position that will be reached in the debate and, and, and so forth. So also a standard assumption of deliberative democracy is that in modern pluralistic societies, political deliberation occurs under conditions of irreconcilable moral and political disagreement so to incorporate this type of moral and political disagreement, we will assume that the debate is competitive in the following sense. So for all distinct positions X and Y, um, either um, if X prefers X, uh, X to Y, then uh, the participant two prefers Y to X or the reverse inequalities, right? So therefore, th thus moving from one position to another will always generate a disagreement, meaning that somebody uh, one, one player is going to like it and the other player is going to not like it, dislike it. And without loss of generality, uh, we will index the finite set of positions as in increasing order of player one's preferences as well as, and hence by assumption of competitiveness and disagreements uh, in decreasing order of player two's preferences, right? So here. So we consider only pure strategy. So without loss of generality, we can assume that the game is zero sum and we can kind of like assign payoffs by, um, by uh, appropriate strictly monotonic increasing uh, transformations and make it the payoff zero sum here. So a debate is any path of play that is generated by a Nash equilibrium of, of the debate game. And now we're going to basically try to characterize all the Nash equilibrium outcomes of uh, our model of debate, which we call a compromise position. So a compromise position, so X star is defined as follows. So a compromise position is basically a top ranking ranked alternative for some argument. That is there exists an argument for which that position is ranked at the top. And basically the number of arguments with a top ranked alternative better than the compromise pos position uh, X star for both player is less than half of the number of arguments, okay? So, and here is uh, our result, uh, theorem eight, existence and path independence of debate. So uh, let X be finite if P satisfies properties one to three, then there exists at least one debate. And the conclusion of every debate is the compromise position. That is the concluding positions of every debate. It has to converge to the compromise position that is defined here. So here, there's a very like brief example with our car example. Suppose that player one is the wife and player two is the husband. And suppose that player one, the wife prefers the sports car to the luxury sedan to the van. The husband prefers the van to the luxury sedan to um, the sports car. And we can see here that the compromise position in this case is going to be the luxury sedan, uh, which is the top ranking position with respect to fuel economy and the number of uh, top ranking alternatives that is better than the luxury sedan for both players are less than uh, one half of the number of arguments, right? And according to theorem A, every debate, every uh, equilibrium outcome of the debate game is going to conclude with the luxury sedan here, right? So the main intuition why this is so is that each player can always insert his or her worst position in the earlier rounds to get it eliminated. And by doing so, each participant can protect him or herself from getting his or her worst outcome of the end of the debate. The only position that survives in equilibrium is going to be the compromise position. All right, so 
All right, so here are no worthy points. So just like constructive discussion, every debate is conclusive. So it reaches the unanimous agreement. And, um, Excuse just, me. Uh, yes. Uh, you you uh, should. I, I should stop. Uh, yes, I know, I know. So, and I, I, I'm, I'm almost, uh, I'm almost uh, just bear me about like one, one more minute. And I would like briefly. That's, that, that's, that's fine. That's yes, fine. yes. I am very sorry about this. Uh, so, all right. So, just like con uh, constructive discussion, every debate is conclusive, right? So it reaches unanimous agreement and is therefore free from the cycling problems, right? Every conclusion uh, of a debate is also unique, right? So it is not path dependent like constructive discussion, but it is path independent. It always concludes with a compromise position. And in a debate, neither participant has an asymmetric advantage to impose his or her favorite outcome. So in that sense, a debate is fair. And fourth, the compromise position, which is the conclusion of every debate, is not simply a compromise in the sense that it meets some low bar of mutual acceptability, but best in terms of at least one reason or argument and respects equal concession between the two parties. So here's the conclusion. So this paper has presented a formal theory of three different uh, modes of democratic deliberation, which we call myopic discussion, constructive discussion, and debate. All three modes of democratic deliberation are consistent uh, with the general characterizations of what people have called ideal deliberative procedure, uh, consisting of equality, freedom of expression, fair equality of opportunity to speak, reciprocity, and so forth. Uh, however, the three modes of deliberative democracy widely differ in the extent to which they confer democratic justification to their outcomes. So the two main out lessons is that adding uh, de uh, democratic deliberation does not uh, itself somehow magically solve the problem of democratic justification. We need when we add uh, deliberative democracy, and if we want it to perform the ways in which our normative theories of deliberative democracy says uh, requires it to, prefer, uh, to perform, we would have to uh, impose a particular structure of democratic deliberation. And surprisingly, far from generating uh, conflict and extreme polarization, it was actually the very addition of disagreements and strategic considerations that led to a greater degree of democratic legitimacy under debate. So many uh, deliberative Democrats have argued that uh, this opposing interest and strategic considerations and self-interest are kind of like bad features that will basically um, lead deliberative democracy to about bad outcomes. But uh, in our model, it was actually these uh, elements of conflict and st strategic consideration that, um, that uh, made our model of debate reach stable and legitimate outcomes and so forth. So the last point is just like my final part, uh, saying that there should be more collaboration of normative political philosophy, as well as like uh, formal game theory and social choice theory and so forth. So anyway, I'm terribly sorry for going over time, but thank you very much. All right. right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Hun. And you yeah. didn't go over time that much, but there, there had to be some way that I had to notify you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, questions, um, you can put a queue in the chat and then uh, I will respect the order in which we get these queues. So if anyone has a question, yes, Nina. Yes, um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, can I see you oh, just a moment? I Oh yeah, here you are. Uh, so uh, I just have a question like on a maybe uh, more uh, metal level. You mentioned in one of your introductory slides that um, those deliberations or discussions should remain open, um, mm -hmm. yeah. right? There was a quote uh, from one of the classic papers. And uh, the question that I have is how do you actually uh, manage to incorporate both uh, the, the requirement of a conclusive discussion at the end that open endedness at the same time, because it seems like conclusiveness is somehow going against this kind of mm -hmm. open ended possibilities, right? That yeah, the decisions yeah. can be realized. Right, right. So right. it's it's more, I mean, like a general just question <laughs> about uh, your approach. I see. Uh, sh should I answer now? All right. So basically, um, the openness of um, the discussion uh, in our model is defined that, so all the potential, all the positions and all the uh, 
potential combinations of positions and argument pairs are going to appear some uh, way or the other in the protocol. So every like position and argument that are uh, that is potentially effective is going to be considered in the position. And the way, so that's openness. And the way we sort of like uh, achieved conclusiveness is that we weren't able to achieve conclusiveness in myopic discussion. Um, and the myopic discussion will only, will only be conclusive in very restricted uh, circumstances in which we have a unassailable position. But the way that we have achieved uh, conclusive, conclusive, con conclusiveness in a constructive discussion or a debate is uh, by restricting the rules of how a new position can be inserted into the discussion. So, um, so the way we've achieved so uh, that is to kind of like restrict. Once you have used a given argument to insert a position, you can no longer use the same argument to insert the same position again, right? So, in order, the restriction is that in order to use the same argument, you can only insert positions that are superior to it than any of the positions that have been inserted by the same argument in the previous rounds. So by uh, it's the conclusive, this, despite the fact that the discussion was open, the way we achieved conclusiveness and limited to uh, was by kind of like um, by the rules of, of the discussion that we sort of like input, uh, imposed, right? So. so. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Olivier? Okay, then very briefly, um, I'd like to hear more your thoughts about this arbitrariness objection that you mentioned. So you took it from Riker, but you also used it uh, when you presented the results or criticized the results of constructive discussion. So, um, I mean, the discussion of arbitrariness that I know from political philosophy or moral philosophy is that it shouldn't depend on morally irrelevant factor. But uh, don't, you, do you, don't you think we could make a case that, that uh, some, for example, order of arguments could be morally or legally relevant using ideas like specificity? Um, and that in that case, this arbitrariness is not so bad, or uh, there's less case for that. More generally, so how do you flesh out that argument uh, and how does it apply to your context? I see, okay. All right, so that, that's an interesting uh, point here. So basically um, the reason why William Riker thought that electoral outcomes were arbitrary was from the fact that you have the same set of individuals with the same profile of preferences and basically you uh, apply different voting rules like the border plurality or the majority rule. And e there could kind of like, you can construct an example in which like, you know, different voting rules kind of like generate different outcomes given the same uh, preference within the same uh, individuals and so forth. So um, the arbitrariness in that sense is that um, the choice of a specific rule or institution um, was, it is in a sense arbitrary and because we could have like equally uh, chose a different voting rule but if um, but if that crucially determines what outcome we finally reach then the then, then the point is that can we really say that the outcome that we have reached by this specific procedure is really what our society wants and so forth and in that sense like um the arbitrariness in our constructive discussion it has a sort of like a similar flavor not in so we, we're not kind of like changing um the rules or anything but we're kind of like changing kind of like sort of the order of how the discussion has like proceeded uh in the previous rounds so if 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 we had the same set of individuals with the same preferences but we somehow it, it kind of like the order of like um, with which which positions and arguments are discussed first seems to be sort of like arbitrary, right? There does not seem to, it, um, you might kind of like argue against that, but but there is a sense in which, oh, if I, if I had only kind of like uh, inserted 
this position and this argument before that, I could have reached that. So if the conclusion of the constructive discussion can widely differ, depending on those kind of like uh, contingencies of like, you know, what position and argument has been discussed first, there is uh, a sense in which the conclusion is arbitrary and will lack uh, democratic legitimacy. But as you also say that if there is some rational ground to justify the history, this particular history of, there is some rash, uh, rational grounds that we have to really preceded uh, the discussion starting from this and this and this. And if there is some justification, I guess then in that case, that arbitrariness problem could be somewhat like overcome. So, yeah. But thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to also discuss that further, but maybe after the questions, because we have many more uh, questions lining up. Uh, Peter van M. de Boas, you had a question? Yes, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I'm sorry for arriving late, but I'm puzzled by the step you perform before going to the debate model. Mm -hmm. And that uh, gives me the feeling that you're pulling a rabbit out of the head by stipulating a game between two players, mm -hmm. which basically simplifies the whole problem situation to a situation where there are two voters. And as we know, if there are just two voters, there are simple alternatives. Mm -hmm. For example, in your example, the same problem solution will be arrived if you apply a veto mechanism. Mm -hmm. If both parties can exclude one possibility, you arrive at the same compromise. So um, my challenge to this approach is considering the same game, but allowing more participants what will happen then mm -hmm. i see okay so that is a very uh, interesting uh question and i agree that there is a limitation of our debate model uh because it concentrates on only two strategic players and part of what drives the result of us uh, of converging to the position of stability is that the two uh individuals have uh, diametrically opposing like uh, preferences and so forth. And um, when there are like, say like three uh, individuals, I think it, that kind of like um, setting might not be applicable in, in that. So I, no, then I think- You can I, have again your standard Condor yeah. set paradox situations. Right, right. And right. I believe my good feeling is that debate, a debate like model, even if you turn it into a game, won't lead to a preferred solution there. I see, I see. Uh, but I, I do think that, that also the debate, um, there is, I, I agree that there is a restriction of like just uh, looking at like two strategic players, but there does in, in actually um, many kind of real world uh, politics, a lot of like political discussion is conducted by two two major parties uh in in not in my country <laughs> yeah uh, for part yeah in many countries and so forth but uh, of course yeah, yeah so i think there is some some um applicability and relevance in that sense but i'm i'm i agree that we should i sh um we should try to think of how to extend the model with multiple agents and see whether the same sort of like results uh, will come out when the game is played by multiple agents, by arbitrary uh, in players and so forth. So uh, yes, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yes. Okay, since we're running out of time, I would like to ask you to keep questions snappy to use Mon's uh, expression. Uh, so Erica, you're on. Yeah, uh, thanks. So my question was about, um, how you define certain ideals of deliberative democracy, yes. but then openness seems to not be one of them, but you could make the case that openness is actually an ideal for deliberative democracy because it affords legitimacy to the decision if everyone is able to kind of speak when they want to, right? So if they're able to give reasons mm -hmm. and advocate for the option that they want to, and it seems like that's somehow left out. And so it seems like it's a very kind of obvious, um, 
choice, like which of the three modes of deliberation is best. So yeah, could you say something about yeah why openness is not part of the ideal? I see. So like actually the openness is part of the ideal and that's why we have like uh, uh, defined uh, and named our the basic, um, I guess like the bare bone structure of the discussion from which all three modes of democratic deliberation, myopic discussion, constructive discussion and debate builds upon is, is an open discussion. So, uh, so openness is good, but if we only, the point is that if we only have like openness, openness, then it might, uh, we might not be able to achieve the other ideals uh, and desiderata of deliberative democracy. So of course we need to incorporate openness. We, we should not like restrict or um, kind of like um, exclude any potential like positions or arguments that somebody can like raise uh, during the debate. Uh, but the, the point is that it's not, we're not kind of like, you know, excluding openness, we're incorporating openness, but we're saying that openness is not sufficient in order to also achieve not simply openness, but also other uh, ideals of deliberative democracy. The uh, deliberation, the deliberative like, procedure has to have more structure than uh, a open discussion or a myopic discussion. So, okay, Peter. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Frederick. Uh, thank you, Hun. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. And I had, seeing the, seeing the agenda, I had already looked at your paper. I just want to throw you a comment and you don't have to answer it because you would have to think about it, I think. One of the disadvantages of Nash equilibrium is that it's in general very brittle. It is the best response if your opponent is playing his or her best response, but it's not necessarily the best response if they are not playing their best response. So, and, and the reason we use it is because we don't have any alternative. We can't access the mind of our opponents. But if we're arguing with them, we can ask them, we can discuss this. So the, the idea of using Nash equilibrium in a context of argument strikes me as odd. So you don't have to answer just to think about uh, for future. I, I see. Uh, so th that's an interesting like point. So like uh, if it's, if, if, if the, all right, if we do not use some equilibrium concept like Nash or something like that, like then how, do you think what's your like um, equilibrium concept? Good question. I don't know the answer. I don't think anyone has uh, put forward any equilibria yet. So, so, so again, so you're, um, are you considering a situation in which um, a situation in which somebody is not best responding to another person's uh, say like uh, behavior, but nonetheless the situation can still be stable? So I'm considering a situation where the two parties can talk about what strategy they should use uh -huh. or they use it, which okay. you don't have in a game, but you do have in a debate. I see. In a debate, you can talk about your strategies. You can ask each other. Right. Maybe it's not in your interest to reveal, yeah. but it still can be talked about. So, so just thinking, thinking to open up to make it more realistic. I see. Okay. So thank you very much. I'll only consider uh, okay. about that. Thank you very much. Okay. Final question by Hen. I think everybody uh, wants to have a break. So I'll put my questions in the chat and then uh, we, can, uh, we can all stretch our legs. Okay, great. So we see each other again at uh, 11.30. Except maybe Olivier and uh, Surush, we can already set it up. Uh, so okay, sure, sure, we can do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so who is going to present? I will. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I can share my slides already. Uh, yes. Um...